Good evening, everyone, and welcome. It's uh, wonderful to have you all here on this very rainy night. Uh, thank you for brightening up the room for what will be a very interesting conversation. My name is Mary Grant, and I'm the president of the Edward M. Kennedy Institute for the United States Senate. I want to thank you for being here for our second conversation in our presidential series, and tonight we are delighted to have Congressman Seth Moulton with us. As voters here in the Commonwealth and across the nation prepare to cast ballots for the 2020 election, the Institute is pleased to provide a venue for candidate conversations. It is essential that we have an opportunity to hear from contenders, no matter what state we vote in or when those primaries might be held. Tonight, the Institute welcomes Congressman Seth Moulton, who is seeking the Democratic nomination for President of the United States. Massachusetts' own Senator Ted Kennedy, for whom this institute is named and who was the co-founder of the institute, believed that a successful democracy depended on active participation. We are honored to have another one of Massachusetts' own here tonight and out in the national race, another person who has actively served his country and actively participated in our democracy. Congressman Moulton has served as representative to the Massachusetts 6th Congressional District since 2014. Prior to being elected to, congressman, to Congress, Congressman Moulton served our country as a member of the United States Marines, serving four tours in Iraq between 2003 and 2008. After completing his military service, he earned an MBA from the Harvard Business School and an MPA from the John F. Kennedy School of Government, and worked in the private sector in Texas to build the country's first high-speed rail line. Congressman, thank you for being here to share your vision and policy views on issues facing the country. As the primaries heat up, we might see some tensions among the political parties or even divisions within. But be that it is may, in the midst of this contention, we at the Institute believe that there remains the opportunity and indeed the need for civil discourse and the pursuit of common ground, something that Senator Kennedy was a master of. To moderate tonight's conversation and civil discourse, we are delighted to welcome Kimberly Atkins to the Institute. Kimberly is a senior news correspondent for WBUR covering national political news from Washington, D.C. with a New England focus, and I've just learned a tremendous Red Sox fan. She is an MSNBC contributor providing on-air analysis and commentary on the national political news of the day. Prior to joining WBUR, she served as the Washington Bureau Chief at the Boston Herald and the Dolan Company newspapers. Kimberly, it's wonderful to have you here with us tonight. Thank you for being with us. And next, before the conversation begins, please join me in welcoming Congressman Moulton to the podium to provide some opening remarks. Congressman. So first of all, uh, Mary, thank you very much for the, for the kind introduction. Uh, Kimberly, it's always good to run into you, and, and thank you very much for, uh, for joining me tonight for this conversation. Uh, it's an honor to be interviewed by you, as it always is, and hopefully not always as treacherous as, some, as it sometimes has been in the past. And um, uh, I can't go any further without mentioning uh, someone else in the room who is my amazing wife, Liz who is here. Um, we, uh, we've both been traveling this week for, uh, for, for work. She, most recently in New York, myself, I just got off a plane from Washington. And so we have exciting lives. We're, um, we're in a constant logistics battle to figure out how um, and where uh, we need to be for our daughter, Emmy, who had her eight month birthday three days ago. <laughs> and, um, She's not here at the moment. Uh, ironically, Liz came in with an empty stroller, which got a lot of questions, but uh, such is the logistics of being two working, uh, two working parents, but I certainly couldn't do this without you, Liz, so thank you very much for being here. I also just say, want to say what an honor it is to be at the Institute. Uh, I've been here a couple times before, um, but 
uh, Mary and to the whole Institute team, the, the work that you do is inspiring to the country and most importantly, inspiring to a new generation of leaders who we have got to get more engaged in the political process. Um, they are the future of our country and they're the future of our democracy and, ex and an example for the world. So we've got to make sure they're prepared and well-trained and you do that work here marvelously. So thank you for all the work you do and for the mission of this Institute. It's an honor to be here this evening. So as Mary uh, mentioned, and as many of you probably know, uh, I spent some time uh, in Iraq and the Marines. I certainly would not be here this evening if not for that experience. Uh, but although I was in, in the infantry and I was first company of Marines into Baghdad, uh, I did some different things over there too. And after the invasion, as we all know now, there was no plan whatsoever, I was put in charge of the Iraqi media in the middle of the country. And so for a time, I had a TV station, a radio station, and a newspaper all under my control. It was an amazing experience because we believed in a free press, and we were essentially teaching the Iraqis how to have a free press as an essential component of a democracy. But they had no idea. They didn't know what an evening a news broadcast would ever be like. There was just the Ministry of Information on Baghdad, in Baghdad, and the, the TV station used to play tapes from the Ministry of Information. So the first thing that uh, my translator, Mohammed, and I needed to do was just help them put something on TV. So we got them a DVD player, and these Iraqi TV engineers would play pirated American movies at night, watching them for the first time in their lives while simultaneously broadcasting them to millions of Iraqis across the country. I was a 23-year-old second lieutenant, I was not trained, I had not gone to Columbia School of Journalism like Kimberly here, I was not trained to do this job. And one of the things that I should have thought of was explaining the ratings system to them, but I had failed to do that. And so what would happen is that they would sometimes get to a certain you know, racy section of an American film and quickly he'd eject and they had this like 10 volume um, set of Islamic history videos that they would put in to sort of calm things down. One night they apparently did not make the switch quick enough. The movie was Basic Instinct, if anyone remembers this. So the next morning there were literally protests out in front of the provincial headquarters. Um, Muhammad and I received death threats, women wailing in the streets, men throwing rocks. Um, the provincial governor was beside himself. My battalion commander was very upset. I, I had no practical control over what was going on at this TV transmitter 50 miles from my base in the middle of the night, but it was a lesson in responsibility for this young lieutenant. So at the end of a long day, Muhammad and I said, you know, we just need a break. We just need a break. So we decided to go get tea with the Iraqi police because we figured the Iraqi police, these are guys in their 20s and 30s, surely they weren't so offended by seeing Basic Instinct on TV. But it was an amazing cultural lesson for this young American when I walked into the Iraqi police break room and about 40 Iraqi policemen were irate as soon as they saw me. They're yelling and screaming and you know, I turned to Mohammed and I said, what are they saying? And he said, he said sir, every time you put on a, a movie on TV, you turn it off right when you get to the good part. <laughs> So, Muhammad and I, in, as one of the ways that we tried to teach the Iraqis how to have a free press, uh, we hosted our own TV show as an example to them. And it was actually remarkably popular. I've been back to Baghdad as a member of the House Armed Services Committee and people still recognize me there from my time on this Iraqi TV show 15 years ago. And in the midst of a war that was so broken on so many levels, um, that in, had incurred so much tragedy. This was actually one good thing that was making a difference. And Muhammad came to work every day at my base knowing that he was doing a little bit to bring some democratic values to his country through a free press. But I'll never forget the day he showed up and he said, Seth, I can't work for you anymore. I said, Muhammad, why? He said, well, insurgents came to our house and last night and threatened to kill me and my family if I keep working with the Americans. He and I thought we were doing important work. 
And so we talked about this. Neither of us wanted to quit. And ultimately decided that day that we would finish the show we were working on at the end of the week and then, and then he would just go home. And so the next day, Mohammed showed up for work to finish this show, and the day after that, he showed up as well. But then the following week, he showed up in the morning on Monday, and on Tuesday, he showed up too. And then on Wednesday, he showed up again, and Mohammed kept coming back to work because he believed so much in the work he was doing. But much more than that, he believed in the values that America stands for. And he wanted to fight so desperately to bring those values to his country. And I tell that story because this election that we're in, the election of 2020, is about a lot of things. And you'll hear all of us candidates talking about climate and healthcare and education and all the things that we want to do better than the current administration. But I think more than anything else, this election is about our values. It's about who we are as a country and what kind of future we want to build for our children. Because it's really amazing how far we've fallen. In just eight years, we've gone from a country of, yes, we can, to a country of, no, you can't. If you're a Muslim, you can't live here. If you're a woman, you can't choose. If you're black, you can't vote. That's how Donald Trump is defining America. But the good news is that in reaction to that, there are people across the country who are standing up. And like Muhammad, they are exercising those principled rights of a democracy to fight back. The teachers who are marching for basic pay, the kids, those Parkland kids who say, we don't want to go to school and be worried about being killed. The women across America and now across the world who are saying we deserve basic respect. There's change happening in this country. There's change happening in this democracy. The problem is it's just not happening in the White House. And you know, this shouldn't really be that hard because I think we all know the kind of country we would like to build. We'd like to have a country where everybody has access to health care, where that's just a basic right, something Senator Kennedy fought through throughout his, throughout his career. We ought to live in a country where the economy is fair for everyone, where truly opportunity is equal. Where all of you who paid, how many of you paid more than a dollar in taxes last year? A few? It's amazing to think about the fact that every single one of you paid more than Netflix and Amazon and Delta Airlines combined. And more than Donald Trump has apparently paid for the last 30 years. We ought to live in a country that believes the science of climate change because it's just science, regardless of the politics, and actually wants to do something about it, and not just here at home, but wants to set an example for the world. You know, if we were starting from scratch, and I said, look, we can spend billions of dollars on military equipment that we don't really need and is outdated. We can spend billions of dollars on subsidies for the fossil fuel industry. Or we could take that same pot of money and put it into addressing climate change or improving our education system or making sure that no matter how much money you get, you can get access to health care. It really wouldn't be that hard. But that's the work that we have to do, not in 2020, but in 2021. But to get to 2021, We've got to beat Donald Trump. And having traveled across this country and spent a lot of time over the past two years when I was working to help other Democrats get elected and take back the House of Representatives, I've been to a lot of places that not a lot of Democrats go to. But they're the kind of places that we have to win back if we're going to win this election. And I think Donald Trump is going to be harder to beat than many Democrats think. 
And to do so, we have to build a coalition. We have to build a coalition of everybody in our party, in the Democratic Party, together with independents, those Obama, Trump voters, and even some disaffected Republicans. That's the coalition that we have to bring together to win this election. And fundamentally, the reason why I'm running is because building a coalition like that is both the hardest and the best job that I've ever had. When I was in Iraq, leading Marines on the ground, even in the midst of a war I disagreed with, and that a lot of us disagreed with in a terribly divisive environment, we were able to come together, Marines from all over this country with different religious beliefs, different political beliefs, and somehow set aside those differences to do the right thing for our country, to serve America. I think that's the kind of leadership we need from the next president of the United States. Someone who can inspire Americans to believe in this country enough that they're willing to serve it to make it better. Because that's what service is all about. Service isn't about standing up to fight for your country when it's easy. It's standing up to fight for it when it's hard, when our values are under assault. That's what patriotism is all about, not hugging the flag, but fighting every day to make sure that the flag stands for something. We have a lot of problems in America, especially today. There are so many ways that this country is divided, and there's so many problems that we haven't solved. You know, the Kennedy family was trying to tackle racism back in the 1950s and 60s. Well, we still have a lot of racism in America today. The Kennedy family invested in education and, and set the tone for how important education is in America, and yet education op educational opportunities are not equal in America today. There's so much that we have to fix in America, but at our best, America isn't a country that thinks we've figured it all out. We're a country that believes that we might. That's our opportunity in this election, but especially in 2021. So thank you very much for, for being here tonight. And Kimberly, you're up. Let's get started. Well, hello, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us for this conversation with Congressman Moulton. Uh, just a housekeeping item to start with during our conversation. If you all have a question, there will be people uh, coming around to collect questions uh, from you during the course of uh, our chat, um, I'll give you a final warning when uh, it's time for you to, to make sure those questions are here. I also have some that were already submitted. Some of you submitted some ahead of time and I will get to those later after uh, I pose a few questions to Congressman Moulton, something that's always a pleasure to do. We've done this a time or two. A few times, yes. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to, uh, it's a lot going on. I wanna get to policy and that, but I wanna start off with some news of the day. Uh, as you know, the president yesterday said that he thought that FBI Director Christopher Wray was wrong when he said that if a candidate is offered uh, dirt on a political opponent by a foreign actor, uh, that that should be reported to the FBI. The president also said it's something that all members of Congress do uh, as a matter of course, accept such information. So my first question for you is, have you been offered or accepted dirt on an opponent from a foreign actor? So believe it or not, no. <laughs> and if you are offered such dirt, what would you do? I would do what any patriotic American would do, which is I would report it to our government. And you know, Kimberly, this is why I think it's so important in this race to take on Donald Trump, not just as president, but as commander in chief. You know, that's one of the parts of this job description. And I actually think it's where he's weakest. Because for a long time, Trump and many of the Republicans have tried to own the issues of what makes America strong and secure and fundamentally what patriotism is. But what you just described is the antithesis 
of patriotism. That's not a patriot, someone who would happily support, accept the support of one of our greatest adversaries. People forget, well, I don't forget, but sometimes it's not at the forefront of our minds that, that Russia remains the only country in the world that could just wipe out every American life in about 20 minutes. That's how serious an adversary they are. And Democrat after Republican after Democrat after Republican over the years has stood up to the Russian threat, has stared down the Russian bear. Trump's just trying to hug the bear, be friends with the bear. And that's dangerous for our country. So what should be done about it? I know you are on the record saying that you support impeachment proceedings moving forward. I th think that are uh, 63 of you and your colleagues at this point. Uh, Goes up every day. Support that uh, measure and about uh, 15 or so of the uh, Democratic candidates for president uh, feel the same. So th you're on the record as saying that. Aside from that, what can you and your colleagues in Congress do, given the gravity of the threat as you just described? We're coming up on an election. We have the actions of the president. We see him saying his intentions in real time. What can you do? What do you want, what do you want the Congress to do? Well, let me answer your question, but let me just first address the impeachment question, because that's a that's a big deal. I mean, we're, this is a very serious thing that we're talking about potentially impeaching the President of the United States. And I know that America is divided about this. So I want people to understand why I have this position and why I was actually the first person in this entire field to take this position. Uh, I voted to move forward with impeachment proceedings back in December of 2017. Uh, before any candidate had, uh, other candidate in the race had announced that position. There was a very small minority of us in the House, I think about 58 of us who voted for that. And the reason as I wrote at the time, I, I, wrote, I write vote explanations um, when I take uh, votes in the House. And I said, the timing on this is poor, the politics are bad, and I wish we had more information. But just based on the information that we have, it's simply the right thing to do based on principle, based on the Constitution. And a lot of people in the Democratic Party, including some of our party leaders, have, have articulated a very cogent case for why the politics, even now, they think, are not great on this. But I just think we ought to do the right thing by the Constitution of the United States. And the Constitution is, is very clear here. And even if you haven't read the whole Mueller report, I mean, just read like a half page of the executive summary. and tell me that there's not enough to be discussing debating impeachment. So I just wanted to get that, get that out there. But to your question specifically, what else can we do in Congress? I still think that the most important conclusion of the Mueller report isn't just the obstruction of justice stuff, isn't just the whether or not you think there was collusion or enough evidence of collusion. It's the simple fact that Vladimir Putin of Russia wanted Donald Trump elected president. And whether you're the biggest Trump fan or the biggest Trump hater in America, every American should want to know why that's the case. That's the most important thing that we should be investigating in Congress. And that's a fundamental national security issue. It's, it's also why I'm talking about national security in this race. And there's way more that we could be doing. If we move forward with impeachment proceedings, we could have access to a lot more documents. We could have more investigations. We could have more people come and testify to try to understand what's going on here. We should be holding hearings um, on the Intelligence Committee, on the Oversight Committee, the Judiciary Committee, maybe even on the Armed Services Committee to try to understand what, what is going on here and why Russia was so interested in getting Trump elected president. That's something we should, want, we should figure out. But how, is there a way to, if, is the issue that the executive power is too broad, is there a way to rein that in? Is there a need to codify these things, these norms that most presidents have done in the past, uh, but that apparently aren't happening now? Is, are, there other, are there other levers? I, I, think you've, I think you've phrased it exactly correctly because, because it is really that whether we like it or not, we're setting a new precedent by not holding impeachment holding an impeachment inquiry. We're basically saying, well, you know, what he's done does not rise to the level of impeachment, which is fundamentally saying that I guess it's okay if the President of the United States breaks the law. Obstructing justice is 
we talked about this before. She has a law degree. I do not. I'm one of the few members of Congress who does not have a law degree. But you know what? Obstructing of justice, obstruction of justice is against the law, right? Yes. I mean, just to check. Yes. Right. Um, a de defying a congressional subpoena, that's a lot of legalese. To, but that's, that's against the law. And as long as Congress just says it's okay for the President of the United States, or anyone in the executive branch for that matter, to break the law, then we are setting a dangerous precedent for our country. And, and candidly, we, we are violating the Constitution. I think that's a mistake. Um, over the course of the last year, we've spoken a lot about your past opposition to uh, Speaker Pelosi's bid to take uh, the speakership. So I'm not going to ask you about that tonight. You're welcome to. Um, but <laughs> what I will ask you is, she is Speaker. She does have a caucus full of about 60, 60 some odd people who would like to move forward with impeachment, a whole lot more who do not. And she has set out a path of a methodical uh, process of investigations uh, moving forward, understanding she has a difficult job trying to keep this caucus together. Uh, how do you think she's doing now? I think she's doing a great job of standing up to the president whenever she goes to the White House. I mean, we all know who's going to win that, um, that meeting of the day. Um, and she deserves a lot of credit for that. Uh, I do disagree with her on impeachment. Um, you know, as I've said, she, I said, she's one of these, uh, one of our party leaders uh, who has laid out a, a very clear case for why the politics and her opinion are, are wrong on this or just not great right now. Uh, the, the polling says that, um, you know, the American people don't want an impe impeachment inquiry at the moment. In incidentally, that's exactly the, where the polling was on Nixon when the impeachment inquiry against him started. Um, so I, I get that argument, um, but I disagree. And, and, you know, one of the things about how the caucus is evolving on this is I don't see anyone moving in the other direction. Um, there were 58 of us who voted for the, I think it was 58, who voted back in December of 2017. Um, there's no one who said, okay, no, we were wrong. We, we shouldn't hold the impeachment inquiry. But there are more people every day who say, no, we've got to consider this. And I think that the number that you have right now is actually probably pretty low. Uh, I think the, the caucus is clearly moving in this direction, even though not everybody is on the, on the record. And one of the things I think is changing is, although my argument all along has been that irrespective of the politics or the polling, we should just do the right thing, I think the politics are, are now moving in favor of, of going forward with this. I don't think having this sort of um, family feud out in public is, is ultimately helpful, helpful to us. I want to get to a couple other uh, news items. Uh, Democratic lawmakers this week scuttled uh, an attempt by your colleague, fellow Massachusetts uh, Congress member Ayanna Presley, uh, to uh, kill the Hyde Amendment uh, in the HHS uh, funding bill. Uh, Congresswoman Catherine Clark, vice president of the caucus, also from Massachusetts, said the Hyde Amendment should go, but uh, told the Hill it would, quote, become a focal point that could collapse everything in the labor bill that is good for American families. And that was her opposition to that uh, amendment by Congresswoman Presley. Who do you agree with? Well, I think they're both right. Now, I guess I'm trying to have my cake and eat it too, as they say. Um, but here's the thing. I mean, Ayanna Presley is certainly right on, on principle, and I'm a co-sponsor of the bill to get rid of the Hyde Amendment. The Hyde Amendment prohibits federal funding for abortions, and the issue is that it disproportionately affects people who can't afford them. That's, that's those are the folks who need federal funding. So basically, it means that if you're rich, you can make a decision about your own health care as a woman, but if you're poor, it's going to be more difficult. And that's wrong. That's not the system of government that we should live in. Um, the reality is that, um, you know, Congresswoman Clark, Clark has, a, has a point here, which is that we have a lot of work to do um, to fund the government, to do all the good things that our government does. And a political reality of the moment is that this particular provision might derail it. I think the point is that you can't do everything all at once. Women's rights are under assault from every direction around the country right now. I mean, we all know these, these horrid abortion laws uh, that are being passed largely in southern states because of one man, because of Brett Kavanaugh, because they hope that they'll get appealed to the Supreme Court and then Brett Kavanaugh will decide against Roe v. Wade, despite what he said in his testimony, not the only time he's lied in his testimony, in my opinion. 
um, and and that, that precedent will be overturned. That's what's going on. And it's one example of the way that women's rights are under assault across the country. But we're not going to fix it all in one bill. We're not going to fix it all at once, and that's the point that um, Catherine Clark is making. Uh, one last news item I want to ask you about dealing with Iran. Uh, after the attack on tanker, tankers in the Gulf of Oman, uh, uh, Secretary Pompeo said that they believe that that was uh, that Iran was behind that. What do you think? What should what action should America take? Well, first of all, we need to make sure that that's an accurate assessment of the intelligence because um, you know one of my jobs sitting on the Armed Services Committee is to evaluate the intelligence that the administration shares with us, and I don't think that they've always portrayed it accurately. And I'm sorry to say that. I wish I didn't have to say that about. Uh, about any administration, whether it's an administration of my party or the other party, but I don't trust them. So that's the first thing. Let's make sure the intelligence is, is correct. Um, the second thing is we have to put this in context. Let's be clear. Iran is an enemy of the United States and an enemy of our allies in the Middle East. Um, they are a bad actor in the region. Uh, they have killed American troops directly. In Iraq, I even fought Iranians on the ground in 2004 uh, in Najaf. But it's also not new news that they are opposed to us and that they have tried to kill American troops. And just in September of last year, uh, Iranians, Iranian proxies, um, fired mortars at the U.S. Embassy in Baghdad. Mind you, just today there's a threat that they will do that. Well, they actually did it in September, and Secretary Mattis at the time, someone who knows more about fighting in the Middle East than anybody else, said we should not respond. I think it's very clear that what Secretary Pompeo wants to do is start a war. I think it's very clear that that's what John Bolton wants to do, is start a war. And the parallels between the lead-up to Iraq and what we're saying, seeing today with Iran are frightening right down to some of the same people who are trying to push a president who doesn't have the credibility to keep us out of war because he dodged serving in war himself, trying to push us into a war. I also think there's a parallel with the lead-up to Vietnam because I think what this administration hopes for, at least those, of, those of the, in the administration who want to go for, a, uh, for war, is a sort of Gulf of Tonkin type incident. I mean, I was a that we might have that today. That there's something that they'll then come to Congress and say, oh, well, you know, we didn't really want a war, but now we have to respond. And that's why I start with the context of what's going on. I don't think it's acceptable that Iran mines ships, if that's what they did. I don't think it's acceptable that they shoot mortars at the Baghdad embassy, if that's what they were doing. But we've got to keep our response in context with what's been going on for a long time. I think the administration is trying to paint a very different picture. I want to get to the Democratic presidential field. Yeah. Uh, this. Uh, take a while to go through all of that. <laughs> We're not going to name them all. I won't ask you to do that. Um, but this month, uh, pretty soon, we will have the first uh, televised debates. There are a lot of candidates. So it will take place over two days, the 26th and 27th. Uh, as of now, you did not make the cut. Right. So what do you do? How do you get your message out if you're missing this chance at a national audience? It's a fair question, but I knew getting in the race so late that, I, that it was a really good chance I wouldn't make the debate. Um, but what's important right now is that everywhere I go, my message is resonating on the ground with American voters. And ultimately, this election is not going to be decided by the first DNC debate with 20 people. It's going to be decided by the American voters. And... And that's where this is resonating. It reminds me a lot, actually, of my first campaign for Congress, where uh, I was running against an 18-year incumbent. And the first poll that we did was seven months. We're seven weeks into my campaign, so we're pretty early. The first poll we did was seven months into the race, and I was only 53 points down. My opponent was at 62, and I was at eight. If you're not a political expert, that's not good. That's not good. But it was the same feeling, which is that, okay, we're not showing well in the polls yet, but what I'm hearing from people on the ground is different. Uh, what I'm hearing from people on the ground is, you know, you're someone that we'd like to 
send to Congress, or, or in this race, you're someone who I think can take on Donald Trump. And the point is that sometimes this takes persistence. We ended up winning that primary by 11, closing a 53-point gap and then winning by 11, and then uh, won a general election uh, by 14 in a district that voted overwhelmingly for our Republican governor. So the bottom line is that uh, I'm not concerned, but I'm also not naive. Like, look, it's a big field. And, you know, um, we poll very well among people who know me, but most Americans just don't know me yet because I'm, I'm new to the race. Uh, so how do they get to know you? So, so by doing more things like this uh, and by spending time on the ground in early primary states. Um, that's, a, that's what we have to do, and that's what we are doing on this, uh, this campaign. Uh, but, there's a, but there's an element of this, which it just takes time. All right, so according to polls, I know you've, you've given the caveat about polls, but according to polls right now, uh, the front runner on the Democratic side is former Vice President Joe Biden. Uh, this morning, a fellow uh, Democratic candidate, uh, your former colleague in Congressman Beto O'Rourke, was asked if Biden was a return to the past, and he said the following, he is. And that cannot be who we, are who we are going forward. We've got to be bigger. We've got to be bolder. We have to set a much higher mark and be relentless in pursuing that. Do you agree? Well, I do fundamentally agree that it's time for a new generation of leadership. And I'm not just talking about this. I've literally been fighting for it for, for two years. I, I mentioned briefly, uh, not for two years, for ever since I was elected to Congress, but I mentioned briefly the effort of mine over the last two years to help win back the House. Uh, my organization, Serve America, supported co candidates across the country running in the toughest districts that we needed to win, and many of whom were veterans. And they had extraordinary results. Of the 40 seats that we flipped to take back the House, 21 of them were Serve America candidates that we supported, endorsed, mentored. Um, so I've been fighting for a long time for a new generation of leadership. What I, where I would differ with uh, my former colleague is, look, I don't think one is higher than the other. I, I don't think that um, Vice President Biden is beneath me in any way. Uh, he's a great mentor and a friend. He's one of the first people who actually came up and campaigned for me um, in, in my general election, and I, uh, I'll never forget that. But I do think we face a new generation of challenges in this country. You know, we face an economy that's changing faster than ever before, the tech economy, the automated economy. We need to tackle it. We need to embrace it. We need to move forward. We face a totally new generation of national security threats across the country and across the world where we're no longer worried so much about Russia attacking NATO with tanks, but they're literally attacking us every single day through the internet. So I do think it's time for a new generation of leadership. And, um, and when it comes to serving the country, I think it's time for the generation that fought in Iraq and Afghanistan to step in for the generation that sent us there. So the, the, the primary is a race, it is a contest. You are competing against the, these people even if you do respect them and you are friends with them. Um, there are a lot of people in it. It's a, it's a crowded field, yet some folks have managed Never to, been this many, right? I don't think so. And some folks have managed to break out. Your fellow uh, Massachusetts delegation member, Senator Elizabeth Warren, has been surging recently. Uh, there is actually another uh, veteran, uh, <laughs> millennial, uh, who is in the race, who is talking about things like national security. Well, well there are two, Tulsi too. That's Tulsi. right. There are two there's more the mayor and people then there's Tulsi. or elected officials, yeah. other uh, veterans, but uh, Mayor Pete Buttigieg is also surging. It's a tough race. How do you compete, especially when it's not exactly, you don't even have a lane to yourself as a former veteran <laughs> of the war uh, talking about national security. How do you compete in a, well, first talk of all, a little bit about First of all, actually, I, I have really have been the, pretty much the only candidate talking about national security. And I think that's important. And I'm going to make my case to the American people for why national security matters here at home. Why it matters if China and Russia are attacking us through the internet. Why, why that matters for American job security. Uh, why the immigration crisis is a national security issue. And if we want to deal with this historic number of people coming from Central America, we should have an aid program for Central America, not do what Trump is doing, which is pulling out why it matters to our country and to our young people if this administration drags us into a war with Iran or Venezuela or anywhere else. 
and we've got to buy, we've got to prevent that from happening. But the other thing is that you know my experience is is, is different. Um, the the leadership experience that I had on the ground serving in Iraq, bringing together this coalition of Americans, which as I mentioned in my remarks, is fundamentally what I think we need to do to win this election. You know, that's not an experience that um, these other veterans have had. And, and I'm gonna talk about that and just explain why that informs who I am and why I'm in this race uh, and why I think I'm you know, prepared to be uh, the next president of the United States and the next commander in chief. You know, I think it's a good thing that unlike anyone else in this entire field, the first time that I have to make a decision involving the lives of young Americans and also live with the consequences of that decision won't be when I'm sitting in the Situation Room of the White House. You mentioned uh, in your opening remarks about the racism that exists today. Uh, the Democratic voting electorate will be very diverse, and some of the candidates have had difficulty making inroads to voters of color. What is your pitch to voters of color? What policies do you embrace that you think will get them to give you a listen and give you a vote? Well, first of all, I think one of the mistakes that Democrats have made in the past is just addressing certain groups like black voters uh, with black issues. Like they only apply to, um, to a certain segment of, uh, of our population. I do think that's a mistake. So I don't think about it just in those terms. But I am very honest and candid about the fact that, you know, we do still have racism in America. Uh, I got a lot of pushback when in my CNN town hall a couple weeks ago, I talked about how if we didn't have racism in our country, I think Stacey Abrams would be the, the governor of Georgia. And there were people who really, you know, criticized me for that, but I just think we've got to be honest about these, these challenges. I think it is true that there are still, there is still a legacy of racism that started in, with slavery and reconstruction that affects the prospects of black men and women in America today. And just because it's not my generation's fault per se that that happened because we weren't around then doesn't mean that it's not our opportunity to fix it. So what does this mean? It means investing in education because that is truly the equalizer in America for opportunity. And there are a lot of people in America today who don't have equal opportunities in education. One of the best conversations that I've had in the last couple of years was with a young black woman who was a high school student in Lynn that I represent. And she stood up at a, a women's breakfast and she said, you know, Seth, you always talk about how educational opportunity is not the same based on which zip code you live in. But in my zip code, in my zip code, it's not the same if you're black or white. And you know what? She's right. And we've got to fix that. I also am a big champion of criminal justice reform. And one of the examples I use is the fact that, um, you know, I smoked, meat, smoked weed in high school and college. And you know what? I didn't get caught. But if I had gotten caught, I'd probably be fine because I'm a white guy. So why is it that recently a black man in Louisiana was sentenced to life in prison, I'm not exaggerating this, life in prison for selling $25 worth of weed? I think we should legalize cannabis, legalize marijuana in the country, and I also think we should expunge the records of everybody who's been convicted of a minor marijuana crime. Marijuana crime. And that's something that will make a real difference in the lives of our citizens. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about another policy. You unveiled your mental health care policy and in so doing revealed that you yourself after four tours in Iraq uh, was diagnosed with PTSD. I want to talk more um, about your personal experience. How did you uh, come to this diagnosis? What's the treatment like? You say you want to talk about it to raise awareness. Right. Talk a little bit about your personal story with that. So Maybe I'll just start by um, saying what a, what a fellow Marine I served with told me once. Um, we were talking about this ourselves, and, and he said, Seth, you know, for what we went through, it would be a disorder if you weren't affected by it. That's why I usually talk about it, and I use the phrase post-traumatic stress, PTS, not post-traumatic stress disorder. 
Maybe that's just semantics, but I think it's important to think about it that way. Because there were things that I saw or had to do that, um, that will be with me for the rest of my life. And uh, one of the stories that I decided to, to share, far from the only experience that's haunted me, but, but a, a story that I decided to share for the first time to explain this to people, um, was when I was on the road to Baghdad on day three or four of the invasion. And the Marines just ahead of us had um, shot up a bunch of um, cars, trucks, buses coming south because uh, there was enemy, the Iraqi army and the Iraqi uh, the Saddam Special Forces were ahead of us. And it turned out that not all of those vehicles were full of enemy troops. And one of them was a car, a family, that was obviously trying to flee the violence and I had no idea that they were running into the United States Marine Corps heading north. We came to this car. It had creamed off the side of the road. The mother and father were obviously dead, but, um, but there was a young boy who had been thrown into the middle of the road. He was about five years old, and he was still alive. And he was rolling around in the middle of the road, writhing in pain. And when we came to him in the, my platoon and the armored vehicles I was commanding, I made one of the most difficult decisions that I've ever made in my life, which was to swerve around him and keep going. I knew that by stopping to help that boy would have stopped the entire battalion's advance. It would have endangered the lives of dozens, if not hundreds, of Marines. And I just hoped that the medics who were following behind us would stop to take care of him. But there's nothing I wanted to do more in my life than just stop and try to save that boy's life. And there, are, there was a time when I got back from the war where I couldn't go through a day without thinking about him and seeing his face. And to be honest, I, I didn't come to terms with the fact that that was a symptom of post-traumatic stress right away because it wasn't nearly as bad as what a lot of fellow veterans were going through. I never felt suicidal. I didn't worry driving down 93 or 95 that, that a bomb, a roadside bomb would blow me up. Those are the experiences that a lot of fellow vets, friends of mine, have had since coming home. And I said to myself, who am I to go take resources from the mental health community, from the VA, when you know, this is easy in comparison? So it actually took me a while to come to terms with the fact that, that I should deal with this, that I shouldn't be haunted every single day by this and some other experiences. It was actually a psychology professor that I was just sort of chatting to, chatting with, sorry, um, in grad school one night, I didn't share the story of the boy, but I just explained some of these symptoms, and he said, you know, you should talk to someone, Seth. And so I finally did. And it made all the difference in the world. And obviously, that story is still with me. That boy's face will be with me until the day that I die, but I can choose now when to think about him. And I also think that having gone through this, having dealt with post-traumatic stress as a treatable condition, having sought the help and learned to manage it, has made me a better leader. It's made me stronger. And that is the experience that I want other people to have who are suffering from mental health issues. And so what I've tried to do in sharing my story and sharing the story not just of what I went through in Iraq, but of how I've dealt with it back here at home, is tried to make it understandable to people that mental health care is just like physical health care. It's just health care. There shouldn't be a difference between taking care of an injury down here or an injury right here. We've got to get to a point in America where mental health care is just routine. There's a slide outside the door that some of you might have seen on the M Mental Health Parity Act, I think of 1994, that was trying to do just this, 
to say that whether it's physical or mental, you should just have health care. But we're not there in America yet. And so I've made three proposals. One, that everyone who comes back, every active duty uh, soldier, sailor, marine, airman, but everybody who comes back from a combat zone especially, will get regular mental health care checkups. So that you just becomes routine. Just like you get an annual phys physical, whether or not you're sick, you get a mental health care checkup. And then we should extend that to every high schooler in America. Which, by the way, high schoolers are experiencing historic rates of mental health issues. Because they are literally concerned, many of them, about getting shot in school. And we should also establish a nationwide hotline that everybody knows, 511, that if you have any mental health issue, you can call and you can talk to someone right away, which is not the case today because too many times people call or they don't even know where to call, but they can't get immediate help. I have a good friend in the Marines who had never felt suicidal ever before since coming back from the war 10 years ago, but he had a really bad week. He thought about killing himself and he called the VA. They returned his call 48 hours later and offered him an appointment in three months. And he said, I'm not worried about killing myself in three months. I'm worried about doing it tonight. So we're gonna change this. One, not very long ago, uh, any disclosure about any sort of mental health treatment would have been a disqualifier for public office. A, did that uh, give you trepidation about running for office? And B, you said that this should be a routine part of healthcare. Presidents disclose their annual physicals. Is this information that you would disclose uh, along with your blood pressure levels and all the rest. Well, I want to be honest with you. Um, you know, I talk a lot about the importance of courage in politics, um, about how Washington would be so much more effective if people just based their votes on the courage of their convictions rather than what they thought was politically convenient. And honestly, I did not have the political courage to share this before because of exactly what you just said, because it has been used a lot against politicians a lot in the past. And that's despite the fact that we've had some extraordinary presidents who had mental health issues. I mean, Lincoln, much has been written about his depression throughout his life. Ulysses Grant, not only a, a great president, or at least he's kind of rising in the historian's viewpoint these days, um, but also a, a great Civil War general who saved our country, struggled with depression. And I was recently reading the letters of George H.W. Bush um, that he wrote to his parents when he lost some of the boys in his plane, expressing the same sense of regret and remorse that I've felt coming back from Iraq. But none of these people have talked about it. Apparently I'm the first presidential candidate to even talk about this at all. But I'm applying for a position of leadership and one of the first things you learn about leadership in the Marines is you should lead by example. And as much as I was an advocate for this in Congress, an advocate for mental health care, an advocate for veterans health care, talked about it a lot in fact. I didn't have the courage to lead by example by sharing my own experience and I thought I should change that if I'm applying for the top leadership position in the country. So I don't know how it will work out. Maybe it will be used against me. But at the end of the day I just thought it was the right thing to do. Okay, we only have a, a couple minutes left of our discussion. Uh, last call for your questions uh, to submit them, uh, but I'm gonna try to go through a little policy lightning round because I know you know these are very simple things uh, uh, to discuss, but we don't have much time. So what's your position on Medicare for All? So I think Medicare for All should be an option for everybody, but it should, we should not force everybody onto a single payer system. And I say that as the only candidate in this race who actually gets single payer healthcare because I made a commitment to continue going to the VA even when I was elected to Congress. And I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. What I believe in is the system that President Obama wanted, although it's not exactly what he got from Congress in Obamacare, which is a public option. Maybe it's Medicare, hopefully it's a more modern version of Medicare since that was designed in 1963, that competes with private options. And that competition brings down prices and premiums for everybody. The New Green Deal. Uh, the Green New the Deal. The Green New Deal. <laughs> I need more caffeine. The Green New Deal. I've made the same mistake. That's why I was quick to correct you. Um, so I, I was one of the first people to sign on to it because I think climate change is an existential issue that we have to prioritize addressing. But I have my own view on what should be contained in it. Um, I do not think it should have a multi-trillion dollar uh, jobs guarantee. Um, I believe in a skills guarantee, which is very, which is very different. 
um, uh, I believe that we should prioritize not just leadership here at home and developing the technologies that we need to have carbon-free energy in developed countries like America, but also the distributed technologies that we need to make sure developed countries come along the way. So there's differences in how I would implement it, but yes, I'm supportive. We were talking about transportation and the T a little bit oh <laughs> before, uh, before this event. Uh, what are your priorities for infrastructure? First of all, thank you all for fighting to get here tonight. Uh, so I, I just landed from Washington and the airport's what, two miles away? It took me an hour to get here. We got some serious problems with transportation, serious problems. Um, and, um, and, and we are now the most congested city in the country. We're not gonna solve that by changing where Uber drops you off at Logan. Okay, we need some much more significant changes to our transportation system. I've been an advocate for regional rail, which is enabled by doing the North-South Rail Link, which means that you can take fast, modern, efficient, electric, quiet, environmentally friendly trains like they have in the rest of the world to get from point A to point B faster in Massachusetts. Not as an option like, oh, I'd rather drive, it would be more convenient, but, but I've, the traffic's too bad, so I have to take the train. But rather, no, I'd rather get on the train because it's gonna get me faster to where I need to go. Does that answer your question? Or yes, sure, we'll move on to the next one. Uh, college affordability, uh, a lot of different plans out there from free college to student loan forgiveness. What's your plan? So I do a few things. First of all, uh, I can't sit here in the Edward M. Kennedy Institute and not talk about national service. Uh, I have released the most ambitious plan for national service of not only any presidential candidate in this race, but arguably since, since the 1930s in the Civilian Conservation Corps, where I want to challenge every one of the 33 million Americans between the ages of 17 and 24 to serve their country. And it's by expanding service programs like the ones that Senator Kennedy um, founded and strengthened like AmeriCorps. And one of the things that that will do is by pairing that with a federal education guarantee modeled on the GI Bill, it will address the core cause of the rise of college debt, which is not the availability of loans, but the rising cost of tuition, because it will apply downward pressure on tuition. That's the most important thing that we need to do. I also think that we should cut interest rates, uh, but we've gotta be careful about that because it's easy to say cut interest rates for existing borrowers. Like that's good for all of us who still have college loans. But Economics 101, that actually makes loans easier to give out. And it makes it easier to raise tuition because one of the other candidates that you mentioned earlier has recently said he would just increase the Pell Grant program. Well, actually they tried that a few years ago. And one of the things they found is that when they increased the Pell Grants by I think $5,000 at the time, the average cost of tuition in America went up $5,000 because now they could just charge higher tuition but it, they were gonna get a grant to pay for it. Right now schools can just keep raising tuition and just say, oh well, it's okay, you just get loans. You can still come. I know you can't pay that much but you're just gonna get the loans to take care of it and have fun for the rest of your life figuring out how to pay them back. All right, so now on to some questions submitted by uh, our audience. Uh, what role does the federal government uh, play in funding special education? A crucial role. And the federal government's not doing its job. Because this is the common term, unfunded liability. What, what it means, or unfunded mandate, I should say. Unfunded mandate where the federal government has mandated educational standards, which are good. We should be doing that for special education, but then we haven't provided the actual funding to pay for it. And it's saddling school districts across the country with bills that are skyrocketing. My, um, one of my uncles, Uncle Andrew, he had Down syndrome. And he was born in 1968 at a time when the doctors told my grandparents he should go straight to an institution, he shouldn't come home. But my grandparents said, we're not gonna do that. And so he came home with my mother and her other five brothers and sisters and grew up in this amazing family of seven and became um, the first s um, student with intellectual disabilities to graduate from his local high school. 
And it made such a difference, not just in his life, but in ours. He sadly died a few years ago. And when he died, we all went, he was living in Longmeadow at the time, we all went to the church on the green for his funeral, my whole family. And we were just shocked by how many people came. I mean, literally hundreds of people came to his funeral from all over the area because he had had such an impact on their lives. Because he got a high school degree, he got a good job, he was a part of the community, he was contributing to our society, and it made him proud, and it made us proud, and it made him literally a beloved figure in the community. That should be true across the country. Uh, what are your plans to achieve gun control legislation if you become president? Speaking as someone who has had to use guns, who literally carried at least two guns with me everywhere I went in Iraq, someone who has seen the effects of gun violence firsthand, including in this story I described earlier, we should not have weapons of war on our streets or in our schools. And I will do whatever it takes to get there. Now, I think the best way to do it is through bipartisan legislation in Congress because then when the next party comes into power, when the House or the Senate flips sides, it's not gonna get repealed, as has happened with the assault weapons ban, for example. But if we have to do something immediate by executive action, then that's a power that I'm certainly willing to use um, as President of the United States. The power to do what? To restrict the type of firearms that are sold? So to restrict a, who gets them? Sure, absolutely. So the, the best thing that we can do, the thing that will have the biggest impact right away is universal background checks. And it's something that's supported by the vast majority of Americans, Democrats, Republicans, and independents. Over 96% of Americans support universal background checks. We should also prevent terrorists from buying guns. I had the two most bipartisan gun bills in the last Congress, one of which was to prevent terrorists from buying guns. I know that sounds very controversial, terrorists buying guns, um, preventing them. And then the second was to, to uh, prevent bump, bump stocks, the, the device used to kill so many people in Las Vegas. The NRA has banned bump stocks from their own headquarters, but they were against Republicans passing it in Congress. Okay, I need to do a lightning round. The other thing round. we need to do, by the way, is Sorry. we need to take out the NRA. Uh, lightning round, just because we only have a, a few moments left, but I like this question. What is one Trump policy you agree with? I, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think he is actually right to confront China. He's just going about it in all the wrong ways. You don't solve the China problem by waving around a bunch of terrorists that just hurt American families and American farmers without any strategic plan and by alienating all of our allies in the region in the process. Like that's the exact opposite of what we should be doing. We should be working through the WTO. We should be using the threat of terrorists but with very clear goals that we want to achieve. We should be, I've talked about a Pacific NATO where we formalize the alliance that we have in the Pacific to apply more pressure on China. And we should be building a cyber wall to prevent them from stealing our jobs and our military secrets. President Trump has actually allocated, think about this, he's allocated more money for his silly border wall than for cyber protection for the entire country. That's how backwards his national security is and it's not gonna achieve what he wants to do in China. But China is a long-term economic and national security threat and we should be more upfront in confronting them. Do you favor uh, abolishing the Electoral College? Yes, I do. And I was one of the first people to say that. I just think every vote should count. That's a principle of a democracy. And a lot of people right here in Massachusetts know that, you know, in the presidential election, your vote's not gonna really matter because Massachusetts is just gonna go for the Democrat, whoever that is, and, and that shouldn't be the case. If three million more Americans voted for Hillary Clinton, then she should be the president. Do you support closing Guantanamo Bay? Yes, absolutely, and I've been very clear on this. And this is something that's supported by some of the leading generals in the, in, in the country. I mean, General Petraeus is, was saying this for years when he was in Iraq, close Gitmo, it does more harm than good. Do you believe in compulsory military service for all? I do not believe it should be compulsory, but I wanna get to a point where young Americans 
truly want to serve their country. So much so that it just becomes an expectation that you're going to do something to give back. I don't know if there's anything that will bring this country together more. I think that's a big part of why someone who was such a historic unifier in the Senate, as Senator Kennedy, was such a big proponent of national service. Some of my closest friends on earth are people that I would never have met just growing up in Massachusetts and going to a place like Harvard because I met them in the Marines. And we don't keep in touch just because we were in the Marines together, we keep in touch because we become really good friends. And I think if more Americans had that experience, we wouldn't be such a divided country. All right, I have one last uh, time for one last quick question. I save the easiest one. How will you restore confidence in the United States in the world arena? Yeah, one word answer, right? <laughs> but in some ways it is. It's, it's leadership, but it's moral leadership. If I'm fortunate enough to be the next president of the United States, then everybody in America, but also everybody in the world will know that American leadership is back. That we're going to lead with our values, both at home and abroad. That we're not going to cede the big issues of the day like climate change or healthcare to other countries. We're not going to let China lead on developing green technologies. We're not going to let Europe lead on climate change with the Paris Accord. We're going to set the standards for the rest of the world. And we're going to grow American jobs in the process. And everybody is going to know that they can look to the United States again and say, there's a country that stands for something. There's a country that leads the world. There's a country that even if I'm not an American, I'm someone who can believe in America so much, like that Iraqi kid I met named Muhammad, who believed in our values enough that he would fight to bring them to his own country, to his own people. That's the leadership we need again in the world. Any final thoughts before we close? Thank you. Thank you for coming here. Thank you, Kimberly. Um, thank you to the entire um, Kennedy Institute team. Um, Mary, you lead an, entire, uh, an amazing operation, and um, you do really important work. But most of all, thank you to all of you. I shared the story of um, post-traumatic stress tonight, among other things. And um, the very first time, the very first time I shared that story in public, uh, I turned to the audience at the end and I said, you know, you're going to hear me talk a lot about sharing, a lot about telling stories, a lot about explaining why this is important. But none of that works if people aren't willing to listen. So to all of you who were willing to come here tonight just to listen, just to give me a shot as a presidential candidate, and by so doing, participate actively in our democracy. This is how we're going to get this country back on track. So thank you for doing that tonight. Kimberly, thank you for guiding us through such a wonderful conversation and such great questions and for, for bringing such energy and inquiry into the room. Thank you so much. How about a round of applause for Kimberly? Thank you, Kimberly. <laughs> Congressman Moulton, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, for sharing your perspective, for telling your stories. Thank you for your service to the Commonwealth and the country. We appreciate all that you do. Thank you, Congressman Moulton, for being here with us this evening. How about a round of applause for the Congressman? Thank you. And to all of you who are here this evening, please come back every day in this room. We see people take on the role of being a United States Senator, Senator experiencing democracy, having the discourse that helps move our country forward. I hope you will come back and continue to participate with us as we advance these important conversations and we build a, a better future for all of us. Thank you very much for coming. Have a great evening. Safe home. Thank you.